Amen. God is so good. Amen. I love the sweet spirit, the Holy Spirit in this place. He's with us every time we gather. You know, he, he said he'd never leave us nor forsake us so we can take that home with us. And uh, he said where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. And he also said that he inhabits the praises of his people. So we got a triple threat tonight, and it's a good way. Amen. But uh, be finding in your Bibles uh, this evening, Luke chapter 15. I tell you, we are blessed here at Ozark Full Gospel Church. Uh, the Word of God is preached here. And I say that meaning that, that Dad has faithfully preached the good Word of God for many years. I tell you, here lately he has been extracting some diamonds out of the Word of God. And we are privileged people to get to, to uh, be here to hear those things. And that's his faithfulness to the Lord. We get calls all around the, the country for people that would love to be sitting in this room where you are right now, that would love to find a church like you're sitting in right now that preaches the Word of God. So, so always remember that we are truly blessed right here at Ozark Full Gospel Church, and, and uh, I, I am so thankful for the Word of God. Amen. Uh, Luke chapter 15, we're going to read uh, verse 1 down through 7, and uh, when you find that, you can stand with me. And it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath bound it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. You may be seated. I've used uh, for a title in the message tonight, A Wonderful Savior. A Wonderful Savior we have. We've been singing about him tonight. We've been, we uh, have set our thoughts and our minds to him tonight. At least I hope you have. Whatever you had with you when you showed up here tonight, I hope you left it at the door if it was going to distract you because I want us to focus on the wonderful Savior that we have. His name's Jesus Christ and he's here in this room with us tonight and I'm so excited about this because there are some wonderful things that we can draw out of this passage of Scripture. Uh, I had uh, I'd begin studying this uh, uh, probably a, a month or two ago, and, and uh, Chuck sent a, a message to me bright and early the other morning. It was about 5 o'clock in the morning. He said, rise and shine. It's time to check the 90 and 9 and head out and look for that one little lost sheep. And I thought, you know what? I believe Dad said it, it'll still be out there at 9, so... But, uh, but yeah, this, it, it is a blessed, uh, a blessed passage of Scripture. I want to, I want to first uh, look at a portion of this. It's found in verse 4, and uh, I'll read that again. I want to look at the very last uh, part of that, uh, Luke 15, verse 4. It says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? And listen to this. And go after that which is lost. I like that portion there that we have a seeking Savior. First and foremost, I want you to recognize that there is a seeking Savior. I tell you, if man was left to his own devices and his, his own self out there in this wilderness, we would not last very long, amen? But we have a seeking Savior that realizes that there are, that there are lost sheep out there that he's out to save, amen? That God desires to save souls. I, you know, God's desire, his heart is to save people from the destruction that they're in. God God's desire is to save and rescue people that are lost in darkness and sadness. God's desire is to reach those people who, who feel like they're lost and all alone by themselves. But Jesus is coming for them. Amen. Jesus has already came for them and he's seeking them out tonight. He's seeking them out tonight. I'm so thankful that we have a seeking Savior. Over in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into 
went to his own way. And so I think about that, that there's times in my own life where I'd gone my own way. There's times in your life where you've gone your own way. How did that get you? Did that get you anywhere productive? No, but there's a seeking Savior that comes to us where we are. He knows right where we are. That seeking Savior can find us, amen? And he's a wonderful Savior. I like to think about why is Jesus seeking us? You ever wondered, why would you seek me, Lord? Why would you come for me? Why would you seek me out of all the people that are, why would you seek me out? Because he loves me. Because he loves me. And I think about the fact that Jesus seeks people because he loves him. And, and let me get this very clear with you that God, God sent his son to die for all people, for the entire world, not just one or two, for everybody. It's up to them what they do with him. But Jesus loves every single person. And, and here he's showing, he's showing us that, that he's coming for us. I think about why he's seeking us. It's because he loves us. He desires us to be with him. Not only that, but see, Jesus lived in a body just like you and I. He had hands like you and me. He had, he had feet like you and me and legs and, and a head. And, and he, he walked on the ground just like you and I did. God in the flesh and in the form of Jesus Christ was God manifested in flesh. And, and he lived just like you and me. And he, and he went places just like you and me and, and he did things just like you and me and he was tempted in all points just like you and me yet sinless where I failed Jesus never one time did he fail never one time did he fail and so I want to say that he understands Jesus is seeking us because he understands where each and every one of us are. He understands the trials that we may face. He understands the hard times that we face. He understands the darkness that, that we may walk through at times. He understands what it's like to be tempted. He understands what it's like to feel our infirmities and our pains and our sadness and our sorrows. He understands all of those things. God understands. Have you ever wondered in yourself, does God understand? Does he even know what I'm going through? Have you ever asked that? God, do you even know what I'm going through? Do you even get it? I'm telling you tonight, he understands. He understands. Get it out of your mind that God doesn't get it. God gets it. He knows it. God gets it. You don't get it, God. Yes, he does. He does into a greater measure than you even know yourself. He took it all upon himself. But I'm thankful for a seeking Savior that understands some other things here. He understands that the, the dangers that are lurking in this wilderness of sin. He understands, could you imagine the little lost sheep out there all by himself? The dangers that would lurk out there in the wilderness. Perhaps lions and bears and things like that. Anything that would, that would seek to do him harm, he understands the dangers that's lurking out there. What does the Bible say? It says that the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Jesus understands that. Jesus is seeking you for good. The devil is seeking you for evil. The devil would desire to destroy your life. But Jesus came that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Thank you, Jesus. A seeking Savior that understands that we're not able to care for ourselves. We're not able to care for ourselves. All alone in the wilderness, this sheep had no ability to care for himself. He didn't know whether he was looking at a, at a gourd or a pear. If he looked at a tree, he wouldn't have any clue what he's looking at. There may not be anything for him to eat for miles. And he'd just wander around hoping that maybe he could sustain himself somehow. We can't sustain ourselves either. We don't have the ability to care for ourselves. And Jesus understands that. Jesus understands that we're not able to, to care for our needs and the things that, uh, that, that we have in this life. He understands that we can't provide for ourselves. He understands that there are some things that we just simply can't meet our own way. There are things that we can't meet our own, our own way that we're not able to guide ourselves home. We're not able to guide ourselves home, but he can guide us. Amen. Jesus can guide us. He understands, and this seeking Savior is looking for you. Tonight, I want, to, I want to also mention in Proverbs at 14, verse 12, it says, There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But I also want you to notice in Luke 19, 10, as I said, a seeking Savior, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. So in Scripture, we know that Jesus came not for one, but he is coming for one. 
He's coming for the one that's out there all alone, but he came for the whole world, but he also cares about you individually. He also cares about each and every person individually. He cares about the entire world, and he cares about you individually sitting in that seat tonight. I want you to also notice in, uh, uh, that we have a tireless Savior. He never gets wore out. Have you ever been wore out? I tell you, I walked Silver Dollar City. I rode the, the roller coasters about 50 dozen times the other day, and I was wore out. And I was still on a roller coaster come Sunday, and I was there Saturday. But I tell you, we, we have a Savior that is a tireless Savior. Look what it says in verse 4. The last four words of Luke 15, verse 4 says, until he find it. So we know that the duration, notice the duration of this search. The, so the Savior is seeking out this one that's lost, and notice the duration of the search. I'm so glad that he didn't give up after just a few seconds, after just a few minutes, after just a few days, after just a few weeks, after a few years even. He doesn't give up on us. I'm so thankful that his duration of his search is he doesn't give up. He goes until he finds it. Until he finds it means he's not going to stop short of that. He's going until he finds it. Amen? So amazing that we have a Savior that, that is willing to, to not give up on us. Have you ever felt like God has given up on you? No. He hasn't given up on you. Look, until he finds it, he's still looking for you. He's still looking for you in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. You've heard it before. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. To us word. That means towards you and me. That's what that word means. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's heart. That's God's heart. He's not willing that any should perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He provided the perfect way through his son, Jesus Christ, for you and me. He provided the perfect way through his son, Jesus. He came and lived just like you and I, and he's seeking each and every individual. He's seeking us out. He's tirelessly looking for us, and he will find us. He will find us. That brings me to the next point here, a successful Savior. A successful Savior, what he set out to do, he'll accomplish. What he set out to do, he will accomplish. Now look at what it says in verse 5 of Luke chapter 15. It says, and when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. Notice that first part of that, and when he hath found it. So it doesn't say if he finds it. It doesn't say maybe he will find it. It says when he hath found it. Why? Because he's not giving up on the search. Right? We just talked about it. he's not giving up on the search and when he has found it. Praise God that he has found it in me. Amen. Praise God that he has found it in me. Glory to God. That's amazing that he has found it. And he's found me. I'm the it. I'm the it. That doesn't sound very good, but I'm the it. When God finds you, how will you respond? Right? So we have the sheep. He's going out looking for it. He's not going to give up. He's seeking it tirelessly. He's going to find this sheep, and when he finds it, how does the sheep react? Run! No, sometimes. Sometimes. You think that's funny, but it's true. So the question would be, when God finds you, how will you respond? When, uh, when God finds you, what will you do? Do you understand your need for this Savior? Think about it. Do you understand your need for this Savior? We talked about some of the conditions that he would be in, but do you understand your need for the Savior? There was a time where I understood my need for a Savior. I know there are others in here that understood a time when they needed a Savior. And he's coming and he's looking, and when he hath found it, how will you respond? It doesn't matter how spiritual you are. It doesn't matter how many different things you've studied, how many world religions you know about. It doesn't matter anything else that you could come up with in your mind, your idea of who God is. The Bible tells us who God is. The Bible tells us your ideas of him don't do you a bit of good. you got to come to the Word of God and find out who God is and what he thinks about you and what he's going to do for you. You got to find out that you have a need for a savior. You got to find out that you have a need for a savior. It doesn't do you any good if you don't know him. 
If you've never given your heart to God, you could have all the details ironed up. You could have the shirt ironed out and it'll stand up on its own, but it doesn't do you a bit of good unless you wear it. Doesn't do you a bit of good unless you wear it. I think about Adam in the Garden of Eden when he sinned against God. Think about that for just a moment. Adam in the Garden when he sinned against God and, and, uh, and God comes looking for Adam. He disobeyed God and God comes looking for Adam and he says, he says Adam, where are you? And I've heard Brother Chuck say before, but God wasn't saying, where are you? God was saying, Adam, do you know where you are? God was saying, Adam, do you know where you are? I know where you are, but do you know where you are? And so I say tonight, when he has found you, do you know where you are? Christian? Do you know where you are? Do you know your standing? Search my heart, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in me, is what David said. Do you know where you are, Christian? Have you ever given your heart to Jesus? Maybe there's one in here that's never, that's never made that commitment and accepted Jesus into the heart. And so God finds you tonight, right here in this room. God comes up to you. Do you know where you are? Separated from God. Adam was out hiding amongst the trees in the garden, hiding from God, thinking that he could cover his nakedness, trying to hide from God, but God knew right where he was and said, Adam, where are you? Amen. And here you are tonight. Maybe God's saying, where are you? Do you know where you are? Think about that. That's an important question because without Jesus Christ and his shed blood that he shed for you and I, for our sins, that we could be cleansed and washed and made completely pure and whole by his blood if you've not received him into your heart. You're separated from God. You have no hope. Your hope for a future is an everlasting torment. But Jesus came so that we could have life. He came that we could have life and have it more abundantly. I think of the fact that God himself made a way for Adam and Eve in the garden and he shed blood. It was, a, it was a, to show us that one day that God himself would come here in the form of Jesus Christ and shed his precious blood for each and every one of us. And we can read in there to each one that's received Jesus into their heart. We can say, we can say that he has loved us and he has washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. The only adequate sacrifice for our sins. So, so I would ask you, do you know where you are tonight? When God finds you, and perhaps he's finding you tonight, perhaps you, you're hearing this message and you're thinking, you know what, maybe I do need a Savior. Maybe I do need Jesus. Maybe this is something that I need. And maybe that's, a, that's ringing true in your heart, and you're saying, yes, I need Jesus. Then come to him. Allow him to, allow him to do what he wants to do in your heart. I'm reminded I've got a dog. He's a good dog. His name's Winston. Very dignified. He knows how to shake hands. He's a, he'll give you a hug if you need a hug. He'll do that. He's a, about a 90-pound lap dog. Some people say that's not true, but I disagree. But I tell you, he's a good dog. As long as he's in the house, he's great. As long as he's in the fence, he's awesome. He doesn't give you a bit of trouble at all, but if the gate's open... Like a greyhound race, he's off. And I tell you, somehow he has surgeon skills too because he, he, he uh, does surgery on his brain and he removes it from his body prior to leaving the fence and he puts it inside the fence and says, I won't need you where I'm going. <laughs> and so then I chase him all around the neighborhood and I chase him here and I chase him there and, and he won't come to me and he'll go to everybody but me. And so usually whenever I get there, he's uh, hanging out with some neighbor in their backyard just having a good old time. And he thinks, well, what's the big deal when, I, when Josh shows up? I'll show you what the big deal is. One time he got so bad, he got out and he kept, he kept taunting me in front, of the, in front of my house. And I had this bush. It was about, you know, about this high. And my roommate was there. And here he, here he comes a dog. And he just runs around. I said, Winston, doesn't even care. Doesn't hear. He is deaf. And uh, so I went in and I got some lunch meat out of the fridge. He can't resist lunch meat. And so I, I threw a piece out there a little ways away. He come by and gobbled it up. I had my buddy. He, he was hiding behind the bush. 
And so I threw another piece out there. Yeah, that's a good boy. Come on, come get the lunch meat. I threw another piece. He got a little closer. And just about the time he got into that bush, oof, it just jumped right on him. He started wrestling him and fighting him and dragging him around. Before I knew it, I was the one being wrestled and the dog got away. But <laughs> not sure how that happened. But I say that as a way to, to, to help you to recognize that, that I was trying to keep Winston inside the fence for his safety. One time he got out, he almost was hit by a car. He could have been killed right then. He could have been killed just right then. And, and I was hollering for him, trying to get him to come back, but he just kept on, keeps on going. And so I wonder, I wonder how many times is God coming and finding people, and, he, and he, when he finds them, he says, come to me, I want to I wanna, I wanna care for you, I want to love you, I want to watch over you, I want to protect you, I want to do good things for you. And they go, Phew. But God's desiring good things for you. I tell you, it's a dangerous place out there, and God understands that. So I want to come to the next part. We're going to look at uh, uh, the uh, second half of, of verse 5. And this is, we have a responsible Savior. It says in Luke 15, 5, When he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders. Look at those words. How wonderful is that? He layeth it on his shoulders. Notice how the responsibility shifts there. The responsibility shifts from, from us and how we're going to maintain ourselves, how we're going to do things, what, what we're going to do, and it shifts to he lays it on his shoulders. Returning to that passage in Isaiah 53, 6, and it says, And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Praise God that he was willing to lay those things on his shoulders. So I want to say a few things that he's responsible for. He's responsible for our care. When we come to Jesus and we give our heart to him and we say, yes, you've sought me out. You found, it took you a while. You found me. And, and yes, Lord, I say yes, absolutely. I, I am all in. Now the responsibility shifts to Jesus and we trust him daily and we believe him daily. We believe that he has, he's able to supply our every need, our daily need, whatever, whatever we might be going through. We can run to him and say, Jesus, help me, Lord. Jesus, help me, Lord. And he's right there because he's responsible for our care. I love that it says in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. He's responsible for our care. And so while we're riding along on his glorious shoulders, we can just put our every care on him. We can cast our every care on him because he's going to take care of us. He's responsible for us. I'm, I'm thankful that he is able to take care of us. Not only that, is he is responsible for our safekeeping. Responsible for our safekeeping. We're with him. We've given our life to him. We're, we're trusting in him. We're, we're letting him lead us. We're letting him take us to the place where we need to go. And, and he's responsible for our safekeeping. He's put that responsibility upon himself. And he's able to do it. In John 10, 28, it says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What a blessed promise that is. Riding along. Carefree on the Savior's shoulders, casting every care on Him. He cares for us. And He's keeping us safe. I like in 2 Timothy 1.12, the last part of that says, For I know in whom I have believed. Now here's the key. You know Jesus. I know in whom I have believed. So I can trust Him. It says, And I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. That's amazing. So we know in who we have believed so we can trust that he's going to care for us, that he's responsible for our care, he's responsible for our safekeeping, and we can go everywhere and say, and say, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him, my life, my all, my everything, my peace, my happiness, my safety, it's on him, and he'll keep it against that day, whatever day may come against me, God is going to keep me, amen? Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. He's responsible for our successful, safe arrival home. Remember, we were lost. 
in the wilderness, not able to care for ourselves. He cares for us now. We were in the wilderness, not able to provide for ourselves, but he's keeping us safe now. We couldn't defend ourselves, but he's keeping us safe now. We didn't know where we were, but now Jesus is going to give us a successful, safe arrival home. I couldn't get to heaven if I tried, no matter what I did. But when I trust the master to take me there, he's going to take me there. He's going to take me all the way. He's prepared a mansion for me. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go away to prepare a place place for you and if I go away I will come again and receive you unto my own that where I am there you may be also praise God that we can trust him we can that he cares for us and he's keeping us safe and he's going to take us home amen Amen. praise God He'll get us there, and I'm looking for that day to not just myself but at any moment Jesus could return And this church, all those that love Christ Jesus, all those that are looking to him, all those that are trusting in him, all those that that have given their hearts to him, all those, his church here on this earth, he's coming to catch us away in heaven where forever we're going to be with the Lord. There's going to be no more sadness, no more fears, no more doubts, no more worries. He's going to come and take us in a moment in the instant, in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Praise God. He's going to get us home. He's going to get his bride home. He's coming for his church. He's responsible for us. And he cannot fail. He's protecting us. He's protecting us. Praise God. I love that part in verse 5 where it says, He layeth it on his shoulders. Look at the last word of verse 5, rejoicing. It's not a drag for him to do this. You're not wearing him out. You're not wearing God out. He can't be wore out. He tirelessly looked for you. When he finds you, he's not going to give up on you. What he's began, he will perform. It says that in Philippians 1.6. But he says that he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. I love that fact that Jesus laid the cross on his shoulders. Think about that, that he laid the cross on his shoulders. He laid that on his shoulders. It says, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us, he took them out of the way, nailing them to his cross. He transferred the ownership of that to himself. See, before we knew him, That was our responsibility, to die the death, the sin death. The wages of sin is death. I'm not talking about just dying here in this world. I'm talking about a spiritual death, separated from God eternally. But when he comes to us and we say yes to Jesus and he puts us on his shoulders, he bore our cross to Calvary. He bore our cross to Calvary. He took our pain and our punishment. He laid our sin on his shoulders. He laid our shame on his shoulders. He laid our pains on his shoulders. Our suffering on his shoulders. All of our heartaches on his shoulders. He laid us on his shoulders. Praise God. Praise God. Think about it like this. He... Uh, he endured it all. Let me, let me read this, for, this uh, verse first to you because I want you to see this also. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, notice that word, the joy, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now listen. He endured it all for the joy that was set before him so that one day, He would come to one of his little lost sheep and place you on his loving shoulders and carry you home to be with him forever. What a thought. He laid it on his shoulders. 
And it wasn't something that he hated to do. It was for the joy that was set before him. Sure, he endured the, the pains and the suffering. Sure, he endured all these things and, and it hurt him and it was painful and it was sorrowful. But he thought, look, what I'm going to be able to do one of these days, I'm going to go to that little lost sheep out there that doesn't have hope, that doesn't have any way, doesn't know how to get there. And I'm going to go to him and I'm going to put him on my shoulders and I'm taking him home to be with me where he's going to be with me forevermore. And I thank God for that tonight with all my heart. Glory to God that he came for me. The Bible says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We have a rejoicing Savior. Look at verse 5 of Luke 15. When he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Verse 6, and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. In verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. He says, this is a joy for me to do it. He says, church, you ought to rejoice with me when one comes home. And he says, even heaven itself is rejoicing over one sinner that comes home. God cares for each person individually and he is rejoicing when you came home. So it ought to be our joy to go to somebody and say, did you know that Jesus loves you? It ought to be our joy to take Jesus to somebody and say, listen, I know that you've got things going on, but you can put them on his shoulders. You can lay it on his shoulders. You can put everything on his shoulders. That ought to be our joy. It ought to be our joy to take Jesus to people. Jesus in us. Going to people telling them that he is able to deliver them. He is able to deliver them. As we come to a close, I want you to think about what we've talked about tonight. That there is a seeking Savior. Seeking so many today in this world. Seeking so many today in this world. He's not giving up on them. You may have a friend or a relative or, or someone that you've been praying for for years, but God has not given up on that person either. God's not given up on that person, neither should we. God hasn't given up on that person. We should pray for those people. We should pray for those people because we know that God is able, right? If we're persuaded, then we know that he's able not only for us, but for anyone else. And he's going to find those people. And so I would say to you tonight that the question that I asked originally, do you know where you are tonight? Believer, do you know where you are tonight? Has things grown, grown cold in your life? Has things become less exciting than they used to be? Has things that you used to enjoy doing for God, do you not enjoy them anymore? Do you know where you are tonight? Have you grown dissatisfied with God thinking it should have been different? I should be doing something else. I should be doing this or I should be doing that. Look, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus went to us and endured all these things for us. And so it should be our joy to take what Jesus did to someone else. Jesus, it, it cost him his life. It cost Jesus his own life. The least we can do is to take it to somebody. So perhaps your heart has grown cold. Perhaps you even know it tonight. Christian, maybe you know that your heart is cold. Maybe you know that your heart is cold. Maybe you know that it's lukewarm. My prayer has been that, that if, if we have cold hearts and lukewarm hearts, that God would set a fire under, that we would have boiling hearts for Jesus. 
Maybe your heart's hardened towards God and you're upset and you think, God, it should have been different. I've been praying that God would break those hard hearts. But most of all, I've been praying for those hearts that have never known Jesus. Most of all. And maybe there's one here tonight. And the question is, do you know where you are? Jesus is standing before you, saying, hop on. I carried the cross on my shoulders. I took your sin, your death, your punishment. My blood was shed for you. All you have to do is accept it. I'll care for you. I'll keep you. I'll provide for you. And I'll get you home. So that invitation tonight is simply that. If you don't know Jesus, come to him. He came to you. Just accept him. Just accept him. I can't make you do it. It's your choice. Do you know where you are? Go ahead and stand with me.